along through Kansas, and in the course of an hour and a half, we were fairly abroad on the Great Plains. Just here, the land was rolling, a grand sweep of regular elevations and depressions as far as the eye could reach, like the stately heave and swell of the ocean's bosom after a storm. And everywhere were cornfields, accenting the squares of deeper green, this limitless expanse of grassy land. But presently, this sea upon dry ground was to lose its rolling character and stretch away for 700 miles, as level as a floor. Our coach was a great swinging and swaying stage of the most sumptuous description, an imposing cradle on wheels. It was drawn by six handsome horses, and by the side of the driver sat the conductor, the legitimate captain of the craft, for it was his business to take charge and care of the mails, baggage, express matter, and passengers. We three were the only passengers this trip. We, saw it, we sat on the back seat inside. About all the rest of the coach was full of mail bags, for we had three days delayed mails with us. Almost touching our knees, a perpendicular wall of mail matter rose up to the roof. There was a great pile of it strapped on top of the stage, and both the fore and hind boots were full. We had 2,700 pounds of it aboard, the driver said. A little for Bingham and Carson and Frisco, but the heft of it for the engines, which is powerful troublesome, that they get plenty of truck to read. But as he just then got up a fearful convulsion of his countenance, which was suggestive of a wink being swallowed by an earthquake, we guessed that his remark was intended to be facetious and to mean that we would unload the most of our mail matter somewhere on the plains and leave it to the Indians or whoever wanted it. We changed horses every 10 miles all day long and fairly flew over the hard level road. We jumped out and stretched our legs every time the coach stopped and so the night found us still vivacious and unfatigued. After supper, a woman got in who lived about 50 miles further on, and we three had to take turns at sitting outside with the driver and conductor. Apparently, she was not a talkative woman. She would sit there in the gathering twilight and fasten her steadfast eyes on a mosquito rooting in her arm, and slowly she would raise her other hand till she had got his range, and then she would launch a slap at him that would have jolted a cow. And after that, she would sit and contemplate the corpse with tranquil satisfaction, for she never missed her mosquito. She was a dead shot at short range. She never removed a carcass, but left them there for bait. I sat by this grim sphinx and watched her kill 30 or 40 mosquitoes, watched her, and waited for her to say something, but she never did. So I finally opened the conversation myself. I said, the mosquitoes are pretty bad about here, madam. You bet. What did I understand you to say, madam? You bet. Then she cheered up and faced around and said, Danged if I didn't begin to think you fellers was deep and dumb. I did, but gosh, here I've sought and sought and sought a bustin' musketeers and wondering what was ailing you. <laughs> First I thought you was deep and dumb. Then I thought you was sick or crazy or something. And then, by and by, I began to reckon you was a passel of sickly fools that couldn't think of nothing to say. Where'd you come from? The Sphinx was a Sphinx no more. The fountains of her great deep were broken up. And she reigned the nine parts of speech, 40 days and 40 nights metaphorically speaking, and buried us under a desolating deluge of trivial gossip that left not a crag or pinnacle of rejoinder projecting above the tossing waste of dislocated grammar and decomposed pronunciation. How we suffered, suffered, suffered. She went on, hour after hour, till I was sorry I ever opened the mosquito question and gave her a start. She never did stop again until she got to her journey's end toward daylight, and then she stirred, stirred us up as she was leaving the stage, for we were nodding by that time, and said, Now you get out at Cottonwood, you fellers, and lay over a couple of days, and I'll be along sometime tonight, and if I can do you any good by 
edging in a word now and then, I'm right there. Folks will tell you to have always been kind of offish and particular for a gal that's raised in the woods, and I am with a ragtag and bobtail, and a gal has to be if she wants to be anything. But when people comes along, which is my equals, I reckon I'm a pretty sociable hefter after all. We resolved not to lay by at Cottonwood. The thorough brace is broke. Mails delivered properly. Sleeping under difficulties. A jackass rabbit meditating and on business. A modern gulliver. Sagebrush. Overquotes as an article of diet. Sad fate of a camel. Warning to experimenters. About an hour and a half before daylight, we were bowling along smoothly over the road, so smoothly that our cradle only rocked in gentle, lulling way that was gradually soothing us to sleep and dulling our consciousness. When something gave away under us, we were dimly aware of it, but indifferent to it. The coach stopped. We heard the driver and conductor talking together outside and rummaging for a lantern and swearing because they could not find it. But we had no interest in whatever had happened, and it only added to our comfort to think of those people out there at work in the murky night, and we snug in our nest with the curtains drawn. But presently, by the sounds, there seemed to be an examination going on, and then the driver's voice said, By George, the thoroughbrace is broke. This startled me broad awake as an as an undefined sense of calamity is always apt to do. I said to myself, now, thoroughbrace is probably part of a horse, and doubtless a vital part too, for the dismay in the driver's voice. Leg, maybe, and yet, how could he break his leg waltzing along such a road as this? No, it can't be his leg. That is impossible unless he was reaching for the driver. Now what can be the thoroughbrace of a horse? I wonder. Well, whatever comes, I shall not air my ignorance in this crowd, anyway. Just then, the conductor's face appeared at a lifted curtain, and his lantern, lantern glared in on us in our wall of mail matter. He said, Gents, you'll have to turn out a spell. Thorough brace is broke. We climbed out into a chill drizzle and felt ever so homeless and dreary. When I found that the thing they called a thorough brace was a massive combination of belts and springs which the coach rocks itself in. I said to the driver, I never saw a thorough race used up like that before that I can remember. How did it happen? Why, it happened by trying to make one coach carry three days mail. That's how it happened, said he. And right here is the very direction which, we, which is wrote on all the newspaper bags which was to be put out for the engines for to keep them quiet. It's mu most uncommon lucky, because it's so nation dark, I should have gone by unbeknownst if that air thoroughbrace hadn't broke. I knew that he was in labor with another of those winks of his, though I could not see his face, because he was bent down at work, and wishing him a safe delivery, I turned to the re and helped the rest get out the mail sacks. It made a great pyramid by the roadside when it was all out. When they had mended the thoroughbrace, we filled the two boots again, but put no mail on top, and only half as much inside as there was before. The conductor, the conductor bent all the seat backs down and then filled the coach just half full of mail bags from end to end. We objected loudly to this, for it left us no seats, but the conductor was wiser than we, and said a bed was better than seats, and moreover, this plan would protect his thoroughbraces. We never wanted any seats after that. The lazy bed was infinitely pre preferable. It had, I had many an exciting day subsequently lying on it, reading the statuettes in the dictionary, and wondering how the characters would turn out. The conductor said he would send, he would send back a guard from the next station to take charge of the abandoned mailbags, and we drove on. It was now just dawn, 
and as we stretched our cramped legs full length on the mail sacks and gazed out through the windows across the wide wastes of green sward clad in cool powdery mist to where there was an expectant look in the eastern horizon. Our perfect enjoyment took the form of a tranquil and contented ecstasy. The stage whirled along at a spanking gait, the breeze flapping curtains and suspended coats in a most exhilarating way. The cradle swayed and swung luxuriously, the pattering of the horse's hooves, the cracking of the driver's whip, and his hi yi clang or music. The spinning ground and the waltzing trees appeared to give us a mute hurrah as we went by, and then slack up and look after us with interest or envy or something, and as we lay and smoked the pipe of peace, and compared all this luxury with the years of tiresome city life that had gone before it, we felt that there was only one complete and satisfying happiness in the world, and we found it. After breakfast at some station whose name I have forgotten, we three climbed up on the seat behind the driver and let the conductor have our bed for a nap. And by and by, when the sun made me drowsy, I lay, lay down on my face on top of the coach, <coughs> grasping the slender iron railing, and slept for an hour or more. That will give one an appreciable idea of those matchless roads. Instinct will make a sleeping man grip a fast hold of the railing when the stage jolts, but when it only swings and sways, no grip is necessary. Overland drivers and conductors used to sit in their places and sleep 30 or 40 minutes at a time on good roads while spinning along at the rate of 8 or 10 miles an hour. I saw them do it often. There was no danger about it. A sleeping man will, will seize the irons in time when the coach jolts. These men were hard worked and it was not possible for them to stay awake all the time. By and by, we passed through Marysville and over the Big Blue and Little Sandy, thence about a mile and entered Nebraska. About a mile further on, we came to the Big Sandy, 180 miles from St. Joseph. As the sun was going down, we saw the first specimen of an animal known familiarly over 2,000 miles of mountain and desert, from Kansas clear to the Pacific Ocean, as the jackass rabbit. He is well named. He is just like any other rabbit except that he is from one-third to twice as large, has longer legs in proportion to his size, and has the most preposterous ears that ever were mounted on any creature but a jackass. When he is sitting quiet, thinking about his sins, or is absent-minded or unapprehensive of danger, his majestic ears project above him conspicuously, but the breaking of a twig will scare him nearly to death, and then he tilts his ears back gently and starts for home. All you can see then 